Hi everyone, welcome to another session here at Big Guide. I'm here as always with our dearest Sina. Uh, we have a very, very exciting topic. It's not looking very exciting in the markets, but this is a topic that not a lot of people understand because it is highly complex and very difficult to comprehend. There is not a lot of material written about it, how it functions uh, in the uh, banking system, um, which is the um, easing process or, or quantitative easing process among banks and the central bank. Um, Sina has done a, a lot of research about it. We just spoke about this in our Persian room. Um, it is not very clear to everyone. We were in the other room today uh, or the other day talking about this topic. And a lot of people have this assumption of the central bank is printing money, which is uh, not really true. And this is what we want to talk about today. Um, before we do that, I would like to just mention a few things. Our website, I'm going to pin it to the room in a few seconds. But if you haven't already, go and sign up on bitguide.io. We release courses on a regular basis about Bitcoin, about, macro about the macro environment, about how the economy works, about how uh, the monetary system works, and how Bitcoin works. So if you want to learn about Bitcoin, if you want to learn about the fiat monetary system, uh, BitGuide is the best place you can start from scratch. Even if you don't know anything, that's the right place to go. Just go and sign up. The links to our podcast is also on the website. All the links to every um, place you can listen to us is at the bottom of the website, both in English and in Farsi. And um, yeah, yeah. We are going to focus a little bit more on um, courses from now on. Sina and I discussed uh, a few days ago that, uh, you know, we're going to spend more time on that. And uh, so don't be surprised if we are not around the podcast content as much as we are used to. But we're going to open also open rooms like the traditional uh, clubhouse open rooms without the podcasting format um, unrecorded for you know casual discussions about bitcoin and about the monetary system so that's going to still happen and the podcast is still going to happen but maybe not as frequently as uh, every week because we want to focus on delivering high quality courses on our website so sina <coughs> Quantitative easing, what is it after all? That's the title. I'm going to propose the question to you, what is quantitative easing? Maybe let's start defining it before we go into the nitty gritty part of it. Uh, hi, everyone. Yeah, it's uh, excited to talk about QE, which has determined lots of the economic outcomes in our world the past few decades. So, um, and, it, and there's also a lot of uh, misunderstanding around it. So QE refers to large scale asset purchases of the central banks. Um, and, and basically the idea is whenever you have an economic contraction, you have a uh, credit uh, implosion, um, you need uh, basically, you know, collateral and credit markets uh, starts becoming dysfunctional. People cannot find loans. Therefore, economic progress uh, halts. Large unemployment follows. Therefore, uh, we need some entity that at the end of the day buys all the bad debt and pushes the banking system to go out and take more risk again. And with that, help uh, entrepreneurs produce and hire people and keep the economy going. So that's the idea. Um, now, mechanically, what happens is Federal Reserve presses a button and a number shows up on the screen as the bank reserves that they hold. So they create 
money, but it's for in the form of you can think of it as bank reserves, right? Um, it's like a token. It's not real greenback dollars that enter the economy. It's just a number. Then they go ahead and trade that with banks. So they tell the bank, hey, I give you some reserve. You give me treasuries or whatever else the Federal Reserve wants to buy. Um, so the bank loses treasuries, gains reserves back, right? That that's what happens, and this is this is done in at, at a very large scale, like we've been seeing, like hundreds of trillions of uh, hundreds of billions of dollars, and um, and at the end of the day, banks basically swap one asset for another. Just just real quick, so does that mean that? Uh, and correct me if I'm wrong. So the commercial banks with whom we have the accounts with, like the um, Bank of Americas of the world or uh, the Merrill Lynch's of the world, they have an account with the central bank at which the central bank can then increase or decrease the um, reserve number of these banks with them. And based on that, plus the interest rate, the key interest rate that uh, the central bank puts in place, the banks voluntar voluntarily either lend more out or print more money or lend less out. So is that is that a fair uh, description of what happens uh, quite literally? So so the printing doesn't actually happen from the central bank. The printing uh, or it's actually credit creation. Tina uh, explains it this way. I, I really love the way he he explains it. It's actually not printing money. It's it's credit creation. So the bank instead of printing some new dollars, they're not actually doing that. They create new credit based on their accounts with the central bank and they lent this out into existence out of nothing basically into the economy you're right so, so there are multiple uh, macroeconomic theories that say how qe actually impacts the economy so the story of so, so far so, you know um, explains that after qe banks end up with a lot of reserve right uh, but none of that reserve actually is able to get into the economy. You can't buy anything with reserve. There's, you, can, you can basically go out and buy bread with bank reserves. Uh, money enters the economy only when banks lend. And lending um, uh, is, is money creation. So when they want to lend, they create money at that point, right? So we have this gap between Federal Reserve doing something with the banking system and, and reserves, and then banks later react to that and lend, lend out. So uh, Federal Reserve cannot and does not directly impact uh, the economy, right? What the only thing they can do is play with these reserves and hope that something else will happen in the economy. Uh, which which they they don't have a clear understanding, but but uh, sometimes they've seen it works, and and so one of the theories are portfolio theory that says okay when you buy a lot of treasuries from banks they have a shortage of treasury and then when you give them lots of reserve whatever limitation that those reserves could have posed on, on bank lending previously goes away so you have. Uh, you basically, both of these factors incentivize banks to go out and lend more. Now, um, does that always happen? No, sometimes you have deflationary conditions and sometimes you have recessionary expectations. Whatever you do with the banks, banks say, I don't want to lend out, it's too risky, right? So that's when you can see Federal Reserve uh, both having an effect and not having an effect. Uh, you know, there there the put the put option the greenspan put or 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 the expectation that the central banks will always be there and support all kinds of um failed debt that created more moral hazard and pushed banks to overland and overly create credit mm -hmm. create a bubble in everywhere right but when that credit starts to contract federal reserve doesn't really directly have any tools to impact it um so so that's 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 a complicated part you know long term they do have an 
negative effect, but but on uh, in the short run, the only tool they really have is a uh, psychological one. But they do buy uh, treasuries, don't they? They they buy actually they don't literally buy anything. They they print the dollars directly and buy um, government bonds with it, right? So they in essence lent out. Uh, printed create or created uh, credit to governments but but this is another qe program right there is different programs is that right so there is this so program of, of when... easing easing credit among banks but there is also this qe program of directly uh, injecting money into the hands of the government which then can through fiscal policy uh, spend it Right. So they, they don't directly go to the government. Basically, they buy treasuries from dealers, primary dealer banks, and those banks will buy it from U.S. government. Right. But the mm -hmm. ultimate effect is, yeah, at the end of the day, government ends up selling treasuries to um, the Fed, uh, basically. But uh, uh, it, it's not clear exactly because banks are intermediating there. And it's not clear if if uh, Federal Reserve wasn't buying that much, still maybe banks would still be buying uh, government debt, right? So it's, I guess, at, at best, I can say it's an indirect effect there as well. But when government issues debt, yes, clearly they, they go ahead and spending and government's appetite for spending is endless. So they find some way to, to, to use it, uh, mostly less productive than what the private market would do. But... Uh, Yes, at that point, when the when the government actually spends that money and starts projects mm -hmm. and uh, hires contractors, then then real money gets into the economy, and and that's actually creates a very problematic situation if you think about it. Um, when you have dysfunctional uh, financial system, banks will actually prefer uh, to lend to the government than to individuals. Uh, so when the Fed does QE, buy, buys a lot of treasuries from banks they have to replace it somehow right so they would they have choice they have a choice between buying government treasuries and maybe corporate bonds or some other ways of lending out to entrepreneurs um, if they are very risk averse if they have a grim view of the future if they they think the monetary system is very risky they'll try to uh, favor government debt over everyone else more than pre more more than the past so that causes finance to move progressively from real economy into the hands of the government and, and makes governments bigger, makes them uh, able to borrow more at lower rates. And then as we, as most of us will probably agree, any dollar spent by governments is probably not as, uh, not as productive as it could be uh, if it was done by private companies, right? So over time, this system is basically allowing moving money out of the real economy and entrepreneurs and giving it to government bureaucrats to spend. Crony capitalism. Wow. Okay. Exactly. Yeah. So uh, this is the this is also the reason why the money actually never arrives uh, arrives in the real economy, right? That's why it gets stuck in the, at the top. Uh, among banks because at the end of the day the central bank uh, does not decide where the money is lent to they only decide uh, how much it will cost banks to lend or sorry to borrow and then to lend right um, so the borrowing and lending rate is determined by the central bank but the central bank itself does not decide who gets it, how much who, uh, how much is uh, created. Um, so they have actually way less control than everyone is is assuming, right? And and uh, especially if 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 banks are, I mean, if you think about it, it actually makes sense why they would want a CBDC, right? A central bank digital currency, because then they could inject the money directly into the hands of the people but then they would also like circumvent banks and that would also cause problems so it's like a it's like a unsolvable problem right at some at some level it's um 
Yeah, uh, really complicated. A lot of people think it's easy, but uh, this is super, super complicated. I don't think central banks, even them, central bankers themselves, know exactly how much influence they have on the market. Uh, I mean, if you look at them, they're using much more um, narratives than actions. Uh, I have I was listening to the other uh, analysts, um, like Lynn Alden, I think, was talking about this. She was saying that uh, markets have actually priced uh, around three to four percent rates in the prices. So the prices, I mean, the markets have reacted way, way worse than rates have been going up by the central bank. So the markets are not reacting to real uh, increases of uh, interest rates they're reacting to the ex or they have expectations that the rates will go up rapidly and that's why they they're selling off so um and the, and and the central bank is kind of celebrating it because they think it's working uh but they're 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 causing a recession, in my opinion. I mean, it's like they're, they're causing asset prices to go down. And you were saying in the other room, and I found this super helpful, a lot of people are living from their assets, right? They're, they're in retirement. They, they have living expenses, and they, they use their assets to, to, um, to, have, to do expenditure or to, to, to spend. Uh, what do you think about that? So, you know, if we had a hard money system where uh, we had very limited credit and, and things were very responsible, you, ha you didn't have so, many, so much malinvestment in the economy. Uh, I could think that uh, nothing that Federal Reserve does would really matter uh, significantly for the markets, right? But at the moment, because we are in a hyper bubble of credit everybody's like indebted to the other like when you lend out to some institution as a bank you don't know the collateral they put in is where, where does it go and what, what are the dependencies in this system you know anyone's or, or even when you evaluate somebody's income to give them a loan you never know how much of that income is somebody else's debt right and this system grows into this uh, convoluted entangled big mess where nobody knows the risk. So uh, you, you basically overly expand credit because as soon as you start uh, deflating it, you, you get into a death spiral, right? So the only way to survive is to keep expanding, keep expanding and keep expanding the credit. So that's basically how we get ever, uh, you know, long lasting reduction, increase in the money supply, the purchasing power of dollar goes down and all the negative things that follow with it. Uh, but then at times when that bubble uh, starts bursting, uh, even a little bit, you see huge, huge contraction and rapid, uh, rapid uh, deflation, basically, and, and reduction of money supply, right? Mm -hmm. Even in that environment, uh, uh, maybe Federal Reserve would, would not really have that much of power to directly impact anything. And as you mentioned, that's why they're really, the, you know, I can, I can think like CBDCs are very sexy to them because that gives them, a, that gives them the tools to directly inject money into the economy, right? But in practice, they cannot at the moment. However, because we are in this constant state of a bubble, any kind of a push or nudge to the system causes that spiral to start. Right, that's what makes the illusion creates the illusion that central banks actually do have uh, this this large power because if they start, you know, creating a, a little bit of a negative shock, the market just overreacts because because of the factors that I explained. So what they can do is to try to uh, change some of the asset prices, like instead of buying uh, uh, buying. Uh, mortgage-backed securities or, I don't know, government junk debt or uh, corporate junk debt or government debt, they can say we are actually selling these. And, and the effect of that would be to pull out some of the liquidity from the stock market, for instance. And a lot of the stock market is like um, psychological, uh, not, necessarily any, any, not necessarily linked to the fundamentals. So Fed actually does have an effect on uh, housing market or stock market through the psychology link. 
uh, and, and through the sales of some of the, some of, you know trillions of dollars of assets. So they try to say, okay, we can't really directly impact money in the economy, but what we can do is go to these asset markets that are in a bubble shape, give them a shock, and cause a, a sell-off. And that sell-off, hopefully, we expect to cause uh, another shock in the credit market and, and slow down all the bank activities that are not even uh, connected to the U.S. necessarily uh, and slow down the global economy. So one of the ways this can happen is when your stocks are going down, um, you start, you know, a lot of people see red in their portfolio. They get more risk averse. They try to spend less. We have a lot of people who are actually living off of the, you know, their, their retirement depends on the stocks. So when the stock price goes down, you have to do something. You know, some people uh, don't have a long horizon. Maybe they're just planning for the next uh, few years. As soon as they see prices go down, maybe they have to sell some other asset to make up for it, or they cancel that trip that they were trying to have, or or uh, reduce uh, any kind of major purchases. As a result, uh, reduction of asset prices may actually then end up hurting the consumer. The consumer will then impact corporate profits and investments and all kinds of other things. So yeah. this is mm -hmm. basically, so Federal Reserve is able to make lots of waves because we are in this bubble phase and any sort of psychological shock has a significant effect. You know, Sina, what, what, what I just got into my head is like, you know, I think what they underestimate is this this association between the real economy and the financial markets. What they have done in the past two years, they have caused asset prices or the financial markets to hyperinflate. We have had hyperinflation in stocks, in uh, in all, all sorts of assets, right? Because of the money printing. But we haven't had seen anything in the real economy, like when it comes to inflation, only until now. What, what causes concern to me is like, they think they can influence uh, a deflationary behavior in the real economy by increasing interest rates, but what 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 i see happening right now because we are in a recession this this is for me the beginning of a recession if not the middle of a recession is that asset asset prices are going down but people are not spending less there is no there there is no motivation to spend less Qu uh, quite the opposite i was telling you in the other room my brother was telling me uh I'm buying more goods in the supermarket because I'm afraid the prices will go even higher. So I'm going to stock as much as I can. And if everybody thinks this way, you're going to end up in this scenario, the, the nightmare for every central banker, where you have prices, consumer prices in the real economy skyrocketing and not stopping. And they are trying to stop it, but they can't. All they can do is because of the same problem we just discussed, that the money printer is stuck at the top, they, co they can only influence the, the top, which is the asset bubble, right? Not the real economy. The real economy has, has only very indirect effects. Uh, of course, it's all correlated uh, indirectly to some level, but the real economy is so abstracted or... or, or um, let's say it, it has been um, uncorrelated to the financial markets because of this monetary fiat Ponzi scheme um, that I think they are overestimating that the impact that they can have on the real economy. Way, way, way more. I mean, they think they can change consumer behavior, but once consumer behavior changes i was sending I, I sent you the other day this this uh, short clip of uh, james rickards uh, who uh, was giving an interview to 
to to a gold bug in 2015 and he explained it very very well it's like you cannot like they have been desperately trying to change velocity or the consumption behavior of spending more over the past 10 or 15 years and they haven't been successful so far but once that changes there it's it's very very difficult to change that back especially if people are afraid if people are scared they are going to spend more if if prices are going up they're not going to spend less it's not an asset it's it's a consumption good if i'm scared that it's going to go up in yeah. price right so, so if it, for, if for it's, critical consumption, yeah. Yeah, if it's if it's a if it's like if it's a if it's an asset, it's a different story. Uh, but if it's a consumption good and prices go down, I'm not scared, right? But if 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 it's a consumption good and the prices go up, I am scared. It, it's actually the exact opposite behavior in the real economy than in the asset uh, uh, market. Would you agree with that? Yeah, I mean, you know, you have discretionary spending and you have uh, critical uh, spending, right? So maybe you will do away with that trip that you had planned, but then you try to buy more of the necessary items. Um, the problem is like we have the supply side and demand side. Prices can change because of either, but Federal Reserve can only impact demand, right? So if you have a supply shortage for whatever reason, you haven't had proper investment, you have had an, uh, a damage to some part of the economy where production has slowed down and that causes prices to go up, uh, Federal Reserve could fix that in theory if they were able to incentivize investment activity to increase supply and production, but they can't. The only thing they can do is impact demand. So when there is shortage of something, they would say, okay, we don't like high prices, so people must consume less. And uh, and that's you know just distorting the free market behavior. Sometimes high prices are cure for uh, high prices. You know, when when the price when something is short, price goes up, that incentivizes more production, right? But but they are basically trying to destruct the destroy demand to to maintain this illusion of stable prices. We don't need stable prices. We need fair prices and right prices for everything that allows us to uh, uh, basically control the economy in the mo in the most optimal way. We need prices um, based on supply and demand, real supply and real demand, not artificial exactly. supply or artificial demand. And they're constantly manufacturing. So basically, quantitative easy is manufacturing demand for debt, and quantitative tightening is manufacturing lack of demand in other words so uh, both of which this this distracts the market and creates uh, problems in investment mal investment and uh, the effect of that is like over the long run we will, we will keep accumulating these bad investment and bad decisions and they come back to haunt us so you know people would say covid caused the crash it's actually covid was just a, a needle um, a pin into a bubble. You know, we are constantly expanding these bubbles, expand, expand, expand until something happens and temporarily causes a huge uh, death spiral. And then we respond to that by creating lots of lots of uh, bubbles here and there. You know, it's like you have one or two houses in a city that are burning, but you don't have the ability to, to, to directly uh, put put those fires out and you know throw some water on them instead they open the dam and let the water uh enter the whole city right mm. so it helps uh it helps with some parts of the economy that needed additional liquidity but then it also pumps everything else which makes prepares those markets for a future implosion so uh it's like a it's like a you know constant uh constant theater and you know, one nice way you can think about it, like for people who are into cryptocurrencies is they are trying to play with this monkey coin. And they, so, so you know, we know that the prices of coins are kind of related because a lot of people try to arbitrage, right? If something goes down and then there are algorithms that also sell something else, like if Bitcoin goes down, you see Ethereum also goes down because algorithms are there or whatever traders are doing things like that. So even to the minute these things move together. So what Federal Reserve is trying to do is like, you know, selling 
uh, Bitcoin or buying Bitcoin to then indirectly impact the price of this other monkey coin that's um, uh, that's in the economy. So they they can't do that that's unless that's such they... a good example, Sina. That's such a good example. Yeah. Yeah, the only thing they can do is like incentivize those uh, algorithms and traders to actually do the arbitrage. But if they don't, if they're scared, if they're if they're they perceive lots of risk, they wouldn't. So then you can do you can print whatever, however much you like in this part of the economy, but it will never end up in the right places. It will go into the wrong places and create more problems. And that's something like central bankers do not want to admit because that basically means their life's work is um, useless. And it, it's in their interest to pretend that they're in charge or in control. They can they can manage things optimally by hiring lots of PhDs and analyzing lots of data to perfectly know how much, when exactly needed and uh, masterfully command the economy and uh, take us on this journey and um, hold our hand. Wow. Um... Sounds pretty scary. Uh, I, I'm I'm always trying to stay optimistic, but um, it is currently very difficult to be optimistic. Uh, thank God for Bitcoin. Honestly, I, I'm really thankful that we have Bitcoin. If we didn't have Bitcoin, I would probably just preach uh, everyone about gold or something. I don't know. Uh, I'm I'm really thankful. No matter uh, what the dollar exchange price of Bitcoin is, at least. I uh, can move around without anyone's permission. I can move my asset around without anyone's permission. No one can inflate it. No one can, you know, uh, stop it in any form or shape. So um, this is the tool we need no matter what happens. You know, I think a lot of people, um, and especially right now, the market is misunderstanding this asset class. Uh, by uh, considering it being a risk on asset, which is in reality the exact opposite. Bitcoin is the ultimate risk of asset because it is absolutely thermodynamically um, outside of this entire massacre of uh, fiat Ponzi. And this is exactly where you want to be when everything uh, implodes or explodes to the upside or to the downside if if we have a deflationary catastrophe or if we have a if we have an inflationary catastrophe bitcoin is the answer a lot of people associate bitcoin with an inflationary environment that it can only be um, a, sa a safe haven if we have inflationary uh, times but in a it, in both ways, if, if the currency of the world, the US dollar or whatever currency you want to look at, if that currency becomes worthless because it is printed more or because no one wants it anymore and everyone is dropping it and it's, it's losing value or um, everything priced in it is, 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 is crashing all the way down, what you want to hold is something that no one can take away from you. Because if we have a deflationary effect, governments will come after wealthy or non-wealthy people. They will come and seize or try to seize your assets and they will take whatever it takes. You can see it already in uh, other countries. The US will be probably the last country but this is the time where you want to hold something that no one can take away from you. And that, and only that is Bitcoin. There is nothing else. There is nothing else that you can hold and truly own. Yeah. Sorry. Since our system is like fully based on credit, and like I said, it's impossible to understand how much credit is being created. Uh, Money doesn't mean what what you think what you think it does. Basically, uh, if you hold a dollar, you don't know what portion of the world's wealth you are holding, and and so this is like you know you have multiple layers of money. You have you know treasuries and and cash and 
and then you have derivatives and all kinds of things and credit on top of this. Uh, these expand and contract, but uh, expansion is like a lot more and you constantly see that money is losing its value. And the, the, the further down in this funnel you go, you still get to soft money. I mean, there's no access to hard money. But uh, since we have Bitcoin, uh, if you have one Bitcoin, you exactly know that you're holding one twenty-one millionth of this this whole pool, right? So uh, one of the problem is is like these games that they're playing with money could have a lot less of negative effect if we did have a way to at the end of the day go to you know buy some hard asset, whatever these banks do, how however credit they create, it's fine as long as I I hold this other asset that's not dilutable. I'm fine. They can they can create lots of bad investment here and there. Doesn't matter for me. And and thankfully, in the last uh, decade, we we have a tool, so that's that's really helpful. And uh, I think more and more people would realize it in in future. You know, if you hold dollars, like I said, you never know what what's the actual value of it. Like a few years later, who knows? Maybe lots of more credit will be created and things will change significantly, or maybe the other way, right? But if you hold Bitcoin, there's no way. The supply would change so it's a guarantee that this is real unchangeable wealth but this other thing is like fluid and expands and who who knows you know what's going to happen to its value a few years later one is one is one is money uh which is political completely political and the other is mathematical like it's absolutely publicly mathematically determined and transparent and everyone can see everyone like it's the it's the most i always call bitcoin as the the truest form of ownership and the most honest monetary system that humanity has ever ever discovered ever and this is our shot this is our only shot out of this mess i don't see any way out other than Bitcoin, honestly. Uh, Icarus is with us on stage. Icarus, welcome on stage. How are you? Thank you. I'd like to add something. When you dig into fiscal policies, monetary policies, it leads to a specific called control. Uh, I'm telling you to be short, Holding Bitcoin is not only about wealth, it's about power. Power not to be controlled by any other, let's say, entity called government or called mathematics or anything else. This is what I look at. Absolutely. Totally agree with that. Sina. Um... Oh, let, me, let, me, let me put it this way as well. Yes. The car. So, um, like, if you have a like catastrophe in the economy happening, right? Lots of banks might not be willing to lend to me um, because they're scared. Maybe they don't really value my earnings. Maybe they don't, they don't know how to value my assets. But Bitcoin is going to be different, right? Because that's uh, mathematically certain to have this amount of value, right? So it's going to be, so when the shit hits the fan, it's good. It should be, and, and I hope the market really discovers this, that lending someone, lending against someone's Bitcoin is one of the least risky things to do. So uh, once the banking system realizes this, um, you will see, you will see more and more demand will will move towards bitcoin as collateral and as the pristine asset right so uh this is also you know a protection against comp complexity in the system um no one knows like the the asset that i'm putting for as collateral for a loan no one knows how many other places i've pledged this to or or like what's going to happen to this asset if i go bankrupt whatever you know the risk is going to be a lot higher but with bitcoin you know, mathematically, the risk is zero. You can sell Bitcoin well before it loses the value. It goes below your loan value, right? So um, I just think over time, we should see more and more 
uh, influence from Bitcoin into the real economy in a way, in, in, as a way to facilitate trade and, and lending activity. You know, the only thing that will matter once, and I speak from experience, this is not something I've seen on TV or something. I have had this experience. So uh, I don't want to go into details, but whoever is listening, if you open your, your, your eyes in the morning and you do not have access to your money at the bank, the price of Bitcoin is completely irrelevant to you. The only thing that matters at that point in time is, do I have access to my money? It is your money, that's what you thought, but if the bank decides that it's not yours, because I don't know, you said something online that your government didn't like because you protested in, um, in a place that uh, the police was trying to chase down some people. You have some sort of disagreement with uh, your government. For example, this is just an example, or there is some suspicion on your account that the bank has some suspicion that you've done something wrong, but you haven't done anything wrong. But only that suspicion is already enough. And believe me, I've worked in banks. I have myself frozen accounts personally because I had to. Okay, so I know how this thing works from, from inside out. Once that happens, you will not care what the exchange rate of Bitcoin is. You will just care, where do I, ha where, where do I have my money? What, like, where can I get my money back? It, it, that's all. That's all that matters. Like the censorship resistance of Bitcoin is the most undervalued thing, in my opinion. Because once the entire thing is frozen and you cannot access your money, no one cares about the exchange. I mean, you won't care about the exchange rate. And it happened to me when, when my account was frozen for some reason that ended up to be nothing. You know, um, the, I, I was like, what the heck? It's my money. But then I found out, no, it's not my money. It's, it's with the bank. I'm, 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 I don't actually own it. If the bank says no, it's no, it's not mine. So um, you want to hold something like that in such an environment, especially if you are in an authoritarian government regime or place right now, uh, Turkey is an example, Iran is an example, Lebanon is an example, China, um, China is an example. All these countries, if you are in one of those countries or not, you will most likely experience something like this in the coming future because the world is walking towards more and more authoritarian policies because it has to that, that that's how it always has happened because if there is too much debt in the world the governments they cannot print forever at some point they will be so desperate that they will have to come for you they have to get some from somewhere the money right they, they can only devalue to some point and if they cannot devalue anymore they're going to start asking their citizens for the money through taxes or whatever. And if you don't agree, it doesn't matter. It just doesn't matter. They're going to they're gonna just instruct the bank and the bank is going to freeze it. There's nothing you can do. There's nothing you can do. So long rant. Sorry, guys, but I had to get this off my chest. Um, yeah. Fire, fire. <laughs> yeah, Anyways. Fire. Yeah, so... Um, Let's wrap it up. It's already 45 minutes. Uh, Sina, you always do such an amazing uh, research. I have to say it's, it's so valuable uh, to give your time. Uh, I want to thank you for that. Um, we are going to do a little bit less 
when it comes to the podcast content in the future for everyone who's listening if you don't hear from us on a weekly basis you will hear from us maybe not on a weekly basis maybe a little bit less because we want to focus much more on the on the courses because we want to bring this message to everyone who still doesn't understand this uh, fiat monetary system we want to um, educate the public on the most basic language and understandable uh, way possible that's what 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 bitguide is 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 built for and we want to focus on that and uh, if you don't hear from us too much on the podcast format um, don't be mad we're gonna do it but a little bit less other than that Sina is going to be around in in clubhouse rooms talking I'm gonna be around in clubhouse rooms but not in a podcast format maybe more in a public format and um, yeah that's pretty much it Sina do you have any Anything else? I don't think we have any questions in the. No, any less, any less of us in in the podcast. Definitely be sure that that time it will be spent on on making courses. So tune in for that. I also have to thank uh, Icarus. He's been uh, helping us a lot. Uh, actually, we've been using some of his advice as well about how to how to you know strategically focus on different things. So and and you know he comes to our Persian room and then also joins the English room. Uh, he's like this uh, uh, this support that's uh, in, the, in it's, uh, beside us. So thanks a lot. Icarus, for that. Uh, Icarus is a hero. He 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 really is. Thank you, Icarus, for for uh, giving uh, your valuable time. I do respect you guys. I'm always be by your side. Thank you. Thanks for being there for us. Um, sure. thank you. Yeah. So, uh, I'll see you guys soon. Sina, take care. Thank you so much. Have a beautiful weekend and see you soon. Take care. Bye-bye. Take care, everyone. Bye-bye.